That was extremely kind and probably a little bit too faithful to my uh, early career work, um, as I, which I am going to be sharing with you right now, too. I'm really happy to be here in Madison. Thank you so much, Venka, for inviting me, and thanks to all of you at the center. Thanks to Andrea for organizing my visit. Um, let me get right to it so that I don't take up too much of your time. Uh, what I'm going to be discussing today are popular Anglophone nonfictions that attempt to apprehend India's social and cultural transformations after its economic liberalization in the early 1990s. Now, you are no doubt familiar with this contemporary emergence genre, even if you have not heard it referred to as such. There are business, policy, and economics-oriented books by economic professors and CEOs like Gurcharan Das and Nandan Nilakani that are concerned with India's standing in the world economy. There are city books like Suketu Mehta's Maximum City and Radha Das Gupta's Capital, which figure urban India, especially cities like Mumbai, as the primary locus of the nation's emergent globality. If you shift the lens, you can focus on the subset of the genre written by diasporic repatriates. You'd have to excise Aman Sethi and Catherine Bu, but you'd get Siddhartha Dave, Anand Giridhar Das, Shobha Narayan, folks who returned from the United States and the United Kingdom to answer New India's call. You could expand the aperture to cite books focused neither on the city nor written by repatriates, and then you get those by journalists like Oliver Balk, Somani Sengupta, and Snigda Puna, also resident non-Indians like Patrick French. There are emergence nonfictions focused on individual subjects like Sonia Falero's Bar Dancer and Shashi Tharoor, who, full disclosure to my uncle, has written no less than four works of emergence nonfiction himself, which I would say constitute a subset of their own. But don't worry, I'm not going to talk about all of these books. As their subtitles suggest, emergence nonfictions are variously celebratory and critical. What unites them is that they all purport to document the rise of a new India and the new Indian subjectivities that are supposedly born along with it. They also mix formally a number of narrative and disciplinary conventions, including those of literary fiction, history, ethnography, journalism, memoir, travel writing, and oral history. Perhaps most significantly, these are the texts to which the majority of English language readers, from politicians to foreign correspondents to tourists, turn in order to understand contemporary India. And while they're not technically works of scholarship in most cases, though some of the authors in question do hold academic posts, emergence nonfictions are, as the anthropologist Oren Starn has observed, increasingly ending up on academic syllabi, replacing writing by our colleagues. Now, in what follows, I'm going to suggest that the emergence genre, right, this textual archive of the contemporary, is significant both because of its wide readership, but also because of what it indicates about the literary and critical pursuit of new India as an object, as a quantity to be read and known. To do this, I'm going to share with you a number of questions, and I'm going to say right now, more questions than answers, that are currently guide guiding my own ongoing considerations of these kinds of texts. So is the genre of New India's emergence doing something new? If the genre depicts India's insertion into the economic regime widely characterized as neoliberalism, does it follow that the Indian subjectivities depicted are themselves neoliberal? And where is the erstwhile post-colonial in all of this? I want to underscore at the outset that I'm proceeding from the premise that New India both is and isn't, that its newness is both real and imagined, and that the rise of the global New India is both empirically verifiable on the one hand and counterfactual on the other. So I read the New India discourse as of a piece with the rising Asia and Asian century discourses more broadly. Such phrases refer to the economic semiotic rise of Asia, to India's outsized economic dream run between 2003 and 2008, and China's US debt holdings. By that same token, the new India and Asian century discourses are also a species of neo-Hegelian fantasy of Asian ascendance that is belied by persistent inequality, climate crises, conflicts around migration and asylum seeking, the destabilization of a late 20th century geopolitical order, and so on. Now the question, I think, for writers of the contemporary has been this. 
What narrative form is adequate to the depiction of a new India that isn't quite? If you cannot fully grasp the status of something, how do you represent it? It's by now been widely observed, and here I'm quoting the editors of a recent special issue on post-colonial capitalism, that, quote, generic instability provides one index of the changing relationship between post-colonial imaginaries and contemporary capitalism. This instability results from the difficulty, even impossibility, of, quote, representing capitalism in light of its unimaginable scales and intensities, and it has taken two distinct forms. The literary turn to genres like speculative fiction, and on the other hand, the return to realism. Now, emergence nonfictions sit, I would say, at the interstices of what's been called a global turn to genre and the rise of what some scholars have called peripheral realisms. And yet, thus far, this genre has been, I think, rather understudied. Now, my sense is that there are two reasons for this. The first has to do with what Jeremy Rosen has recently diagnosed as a pervasive conflation of genre, which is a property of all texts, and genre fiction which are popular fictional subfields like Chicklet and the zombie novel, or in the Indian context, Cricklet and Bharati <laughs> fantasy. Now this conflation has served to obscure the significant generic hybridity of non-fictions, of which I'll have more to say later on. The second reason, I think, ironically enough, is that critical interest in the rise of the non-fictional or non-fictionality within the narrative universes of contemporary literary fictions has come to stand in for analysis of nonfictions themselves. Thus, critics observe the presence of journalistic registers of prose within novels by former journalists like Arvind Nadiga, Raj Kamal Jha, and Jeet Thayil, and the presence of nonfictional frame stories in the pulp fictions of someone like Chetan Bhagat. They read the city books of the emergence genre in relation to fictions of urban New India. And they note with interest Arvind Nati Roy's move from the novel to journalism and back again. But the driving interest is generally an expanded theory of literary fiction and its apprehension of the real. By contrast, I'm interested in pursuing the generic properties of and truth claims made by emergence nonfictions themselves. With their breathless avowals of elephant and tiger economies, preoccupation with sites like call centers, and fascination with entrepreneurial exuberance, even the most critical among these texts traffics in tropes that have been demonstrated to be among neoliberalism's enabling fictions. So put simply, I would say emergence writers may not be fictionalizing the real, but they are realizing the fiction that is New India. The fiction that is also a neoliberal <coughs> New India. And I want to turn now to that term, neoliberal, and the question of its relationship to the Indian contemporary. In the works of emergence writers, literary critics, and social theorists equally, the new in New India tends to signify two things, neoliberalism and the eclipse of the post-colonial. And the former always seems to imply the latter, as the following examples might suggest. In the 2013 volume, Enterprise Culture in Neoliberal India, for example, Nandini Guptu shows how the rhetoric of New Indian dynamism, aspiration, and entrepreneurialism is specifically couched as a rejection of an old stagnant Indian cultural milieu, quote, spawned by an autarkic post-colonial developmental state. For Anand Giridharadas, the reality of New India contrasts with his childhood imaginings of a, quote, pre-capitalist India that blended Nehru's Fabian socialism, Gandhi's homespun self-sufficiency, post-colonial anti-imperialism, and we're all in it together collectivism, end quote. Akash Kapoor contrasts America's capitalist exuberance with, quote, India's austere socialism in the decades before liberalization and concludes that the post-postcolonial India is effectively America. Patrick French notes that the, quote, post-colonial outlook, vital in the early years of freedom as a means to take the nation forward and as an antidote to constant Western assumptions about the restricted destiny of former colonies, has become an intellectual straitjacket which limits fresh thought at a time when something new is happening, end quote. And again, this something new is India's insertion into neoliberal finance capital, and what it has supposedly set loose is an Indian dream in the Asian century as poignant as the American dream once was. Now, such modes of narrating India's present assume a post-colonial nation state 
and more specifically a Nehruvian developmental state, that in responding to histories of imperial domination was necessarily resistant to global capitalism. But post-colonialism, insofar as it participates in a larger reparative project of, quote, seeking power, equality, and mutual respect on the world stage, and I'm going back to that issue on post-colonial capitalism that I mentioned, has also always been an agent of capitalism. And this has been as true of Nehruvian developmentalism, as a number of critics have argued. Um, for example, Rohit Char Chopra argues that Nehruvian developmentalism preserved the nomos of the cultural, educational, and economic fields shaped in the colonial era by privileging scientific and technological progress qua progress. It's been as true of some of these modes as it is of what we now call liberalism and neoliberalism. The neoliberal present, in other words, may be more consistent with the post-colonial past than observers of the new India, in positing its newness, are wont to assume. And the neoliberal subjects of new India, like Snigda Poonam's dreamer, might also be understood as incarnations of a post-colonial entrepreneur, who already had to contend with the legacies of imperialism in their languages, nations, social relations, and senses of self. Recognizing some of the discursive continuities between post-colonialism and neoliberalism sheds light on the nature, I think, of global India's supposedly emergent and new forms of subjectivity. I'm thinking here of a subject like the New Indian Jugadu, whose improvisatory hacks, to use Amit Rai's description, are considered at once essentially Indian, pre-modern, innovative, neoliberal, value-blocking, celebrated as the new rule for frugalizing India, and at the same time critiqued as extra-legal exception. Jagad as social practice is both subject to corporate capture as innovation, and yet also somehow characterized by its dynamics of non-capitalist refusal. I would argue that one way to begin to make sense of the contradictory nature of such a figure is to acknowledge his essential familiarity. The new Indian entrepreneur, in other words, often looks and sounds a lot like the old post-colonial bricoleur. Now, before I go too far with this line of argument, I want to clarify the stakes of my position, or at least to try to. When I suggest that the neoliberal present may be continuous with the post-colonial past, am I not simply misapprehending the contemporary by reading with the jaundiced eyes of someone trained in post-colonialism? I'm going to try to head off some such objections with reference to the work of one of your other recent speakers, Ulka Anjaria. In her terrific new book, Reading New India, or no, Reading India Now, which I'm appropriately reading now, um, Anjaria argues that post-colonialism as a critical project is inadequate to the apprehension of New India because it cannot acknowledge the political and cultural contradictions of the contemporary and furthermore reads its literary and cultural productions as capitulations to capitalism. So Anjaria finds that those she calls progressive critics are hewing to what she deems outdated post-colonial tropes and are dismissive of contemporary Indian cultural formations because they read its as expression of aspiration as what she calls one of the biopolitic bio So this, to my mind, is a fair point, and she may well have shared some of this with all of you recently. And in other places, I have discussed my own resistance to the writing of someone like a Chetan Bhagat, though I would say my resistance is to his opportunistic disavowal of elites and address to a least common denominator among Anglophone readers and not his giving voice to aspiration as such. But in any case, I agree with Anjaria that we need to pay attention to the language in which contemporary Indian lives and futures are actually being imagined and lived, as opposed to how we critics, largely situated in the Anglo-American Academy, think they ought to be. But I think I would go one step further. We need to pay attention not only to what new Indian literatures say, but how and why we critics are reading them the way we do. So I think it matters if we're reading the contemporary specifically for the eclipse of the post-colonial, or for signs of its persistence, or as an occasion to revise our assumptions about it. I also think it matters how we understand the relationship between the literature and the criticism. If we believe that the former has greater purchase on the contemporary, that it better approaches a veridic discourse on New India, and that it, not its critical counterpart, is a site of truth or an engagement with the real, then we will be suspicious of those who question its politics, its aesthetics, and its good faith. But if we allow that the literature and the criticism always cross-pollinate, if we suspend our assumptions about which is primary and which is secondary, 
then we stand not only to complexify our accounts of post-colonialism, but also better trouble and understand the newness of New India. So this is the spirit in which I am trying to read the emergence genre, and which motors my arguments here and elsewhere that contemporary New Indian cultural formations are more bound to the past and more engaged with the supposedly outmoded post-colonial than not. But okay, I need to tell you more about the genre. And I'm gonna look closely here at a subset of texts written by Indians in diaspora <coughs> whose returns to India occasion the writing of their emergence nonfictions. Now my interest in this subset of texts is threefold. First, these works demonstrate the enduring significance of exilic perspective despite the widespread critical attenuation of post-colonialism. Even when the narrative of diasporic <coughs> dispersal is consummated in return, the exilic bandage sustains and motors these writers' engagements with home and abroad. The tropology of New India itself can thus be understood to result from the diasporic repatriate's conflation of his re-encounter with home. The newness he perceives in the flyover where there once was a cricket pitch, or the newness he perceives in the gray hairs of his aging parents, and India's present relationship to its history and the world. New India becomes new, in other words, because in the eyes of these observers, it is India apprehended anew. New India is also new because it is not real. So for instance, in Calcutta, Amit Chaudhry strains to inhabit, quote, both the real Calcutta he visited as a child and the new Indian city in which he finds himself. For Chaudhry, who like a number of emergence writers is also a novelist, writing nonfiction actually means excising the real not excavating it. For despite his efforts to be present to the new India, the Calcutta streets he knew a quarter century ago continually interrupt his thoughts, threatening to conceal from him, quote, the ways in which people belong to the city now. And again and again in the emergence genre we find this. We find that reality has its fullest expression in the workings of memory. The real is that to which one is attached, as opposed to that which can be empirically observed. Second, these emergence nonfictions triangulate a migratory itinerary, right, the author's return, with a macro-historical narrative, which is this neo-Hegelian neo rise of India, and the ostensibly new subjectivities of more rooted Indians whose lives illuminate India's experiments with globality in ways that are otherwise unavailable to the diaspora return. So chapter by chapter, each of these works offers these illustrative case studies of new Indian subjects who have supposedly internalized market logics, engaged in practices of self-maximization, and emblematized India's new global prominence. I have chosen to tell only five stories from the countless available, Siddhartha Dev writes. So many Gupta says, I am telling only seven stories in a billion who don't represent the whole of India, and yet they represent the yearnings of India's most transformative generation. All of these new Indians are hailed as informants and tapped for their local knowledges. They're rendered as types, and these types appear across the text. So New India has its Gatsby's, its do-gooders, its professional women, its suiciding farmers, its call center agents, its bar dancers. There are poet revolutionaries, artists in exile, CEOs, real estate moguls, and petty politicians. Babes Abdul Jabbar, an activist in Bhopal who runs an organization for widows, ends up serving the same narrative purpose as Meenakshi, a self-appointed representative of Balswa settlement in Rana Dasgupta's capital, and so on. And for a paragraph, or a few pages, the life of each of these new Indians seems, as Anand Giridhar Das writes, to quote, distill in a single being the new sense of hope gusting through India. To put a finer point on it, the narrative structure of emergence nonfiction registers new Indian enterprise as informancy. And each of these subjects produces knowledge about themselves as a form of tribute. And here I'm borrowing Srinivas Aravamudan's reading of Barney Cohn, that will then be interpreted, recoded, and transmitted by a fellow Indian emergence writer who is then going to be interpolated as an informant in the West. Finally, this particular subset of emergence nonfictions is interesting because it utilizes the conventions of a range of other nonfictional genres, including history, ethnography, journalism, memoir, travel writing, and oral history. Thus, a text like Suketu Mehta's Maximum City can be described by Amitabha Kumar as part reportage, a documentary, and a memoir of migration, where Anki Mukherjee calls the same text journalistic docufiction, 
And for Ipshit Bagosh, it's a semi-autobiographical novel, and so on. Because emergence nonfiction cannot be read in exclusive relation to one or another form, right? It's not simply a kind of travel writing or a kind of memoir. It might reasonably be characterized as hybrid. But I think this hybridity requires further specification. The emergence genre not only troubles the boundaries between nonfictional forms, but more specifically the boundaries between scholarly and public writing, and between the conceptual apparatuses of disciplines and genres. So to stay with the example of Maximum City, Mehta's highly textualized interpretations of encounters with other Indians reflect both his novelistic rendering of a classic insider-outsider narrative and an ethnographic mode of realist apprehension, what Anand Pandyan has called an anthropological imagination, a belief that when confronted with an ordinary individual, quote, there are many others like him scattered here and there and beyond. This slippage between the literary and social scientific, sort of broadly construed, is precisely what characterizes the genre. And it indicates that when it comes to writing the contemporary New India, New India has made amateurs and experts of us all. So I'm going to back up. And you would have noticed these slides don't always hew exactly to what I'm saying. Just a distraction. Um, I'm going to back up now so as to move forward down another path. The emergence genre depicts New India, but as you probably already sense, its themes and politics, forms and concerns are not really new. Now there's more than one story we might want to tell about the genre's antecedents, and I'm gonna mention two. One in brief, in a spirit of suggestion, and a second at some greater length. So first in brief. In 2013, Amit Chowdhury's agent told him to write Calcutta, Two Years in the City, because supposedly Indian nonfiction was going to be the new Indian fiction. Now how did the agent know what the market was going to decide? In provocative recent work, Rowan Cantor has argued that the emergence of Latin American literature on the world stage in the 1960s, think Borges, Octavio Paz, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, prefigured the rise of Indian Anglophone literature in the 1980s and 1990s. She further suggests that generic progressions within each tradition are intrinsic to the market phenomenon of what she calls the literary boom. In this light, the thread we might draw from the magical realism of Salman Rushdie to the realist hieroglyphics of Arvind Badiga to emergence nonfiction <coughs> might simply be a more recent iteration of the Latin American trajectory from magical realism to social realism to the testimonial. And Chowdhury's agent may have been referring as much to the past as to the future. That's the suggestion. At greater length, I want to talk a little bit about some non-fictional antecedents. Now, I mentioned earlier that most scholars writing about these texts do so in relationship to fiction. So for example, in a brief review, Manu Goswami reads the genre as updating the once dominant fictional genre of magical realism, and Anki Mukherjee reads it as, quote, subscribing to the humanitarian aims and objectives we relate with the rise of the English novel, and so on. Such readings tend to forget the long tradition of Indian Anglophone nonfiction on which the emergence genre draws. Specifically, the texts I want to identify sort of heuristically as Idea of India books, Home to India narratives, and the Nepalian travelogue. And I would attribute to these texts key features of the emergence genre, including its maximization of exilic perspective as the locus of social critique, and the writing of the new Indian subject as an enterprising informant. And by elaborating them now, I want to redirect our attention from the genre supposedly new characterological vocabulary and form to its repurposing of some familiar post-colonial tropes and narrative strategies. So what I'm calling idea of India books first are not necessarily those that advance their own ideas of India, but rather they are works, both scholarly and journalistic, that are concerned with the idea of India as idea or as the name for the idea of contradiction, plurality, and multiplicity. So, for example, in Imagining India, Ronald Indian, Indian shows how India has throughout history been imagined, read, and written both by empirical realists and romantic idealists as an area of darkness and a beacon of light, as the product of Orientalist projection and of anti-colonial assertion, as a manifestation of nationalist critique and of diasporic nostalgia, as an imperialist project and an occupying force, and so on. 
More journalistic idea of India books are also explorations of the idea of India as a land of exceptional and plural contradiction. So the old joke is that anything you say about India, the opposite is also true, writes Shashi Tharoor. Or our contrasts are cliches, observes Nandan Nilakani. In fact, the idea of contrast as the defining element of India is itself the cliche. And this is important not only because it allows us to identify the common trope of new Indian contradiction as an extension of older imaginings of India, but also because it foregrounds how India's identity, not its military exports, natural resources, but its identity, has been conceptualized as its primary asset and contribution to the world. In his The Idea of India, Sunil Kilnani observes that almost all of the Indian nationalists, Gandhi, Patel, Bose, Ambedkar, Nehru, created and expressed their public selves through the genre of the didactic autobiography, which, quote, fused picaresque personal adventures with the odyssey of the nation. These didactic autobiographies were the first idea of India books. The discovery of India, as you recall, Nehru called it, required a return to the village masses, to India's country folk. Traveling through the country in the 1920s and 1930s, Nehru discovered that, quote, India was like some ancient <coughs> obsessed on which layer upon layer of thought and reverie had been inscribed, and yet no succeeding layer had completely hidden or erased what had been written previously, right? These are famous words. He wrote of his meetings with peasants and his inculcation in them of an idea of Bharat Mata. This idea, he wrote, slowly soaked into their brains, their eyes would light up as if they had made a great discovery, and so on. Now it should be noted that Nehru was the generator of these ideas of Bharat Mata, and the peasants were subjects of his nationalist tutelage. By contrast, emergence nonfictionists glean ideas of India from the modern day analogues of Nehru's peasants, like Ramdas, a 60 year old Dalit cowbroker whose story Akash Kapoor reads as a quintessentially Indian story of ruin and reinvention. Nehru gives an idea of India to the ordinary people he meets. Emergence writers derive India from their everyday encounters. But they all share this allegorical twinning of the individual's narrative of awakening with that of the nation, as well as Nehru's professed faith in the cross-cultural, cross-class, and caste mutual intelligibility of all Indians. Let me go back for a second. I'm going to talk about these books, Home to India books. You're likely familiar with a certain post-colonial discourse on exile and the expatriate, what we might shorthand as the imaginary homelands discourse. In this earlier post-colonial moment, return to India was imaginative and literary, return from a distance, return as a compensatory mechanism for migration. So fearing the loss of authenticity, the story goes, Indian writers like Salman Rushdie and Vikram Saint returned to India as subject matter. After New India, the story is that return has become a practice of physically, corporeally closing the temporal and spatial gap between India and diaspora. Writers, as the emergence genre shows, are literally going home. But if we look beyond the literary fictions of these diasporic Anglophonists like Rushdie and Sait, we find that narratives of repatriation are not at all unique to the contemporary moment. So authors, for example, of what I'm calling home to India narratives have long been interested in reclaiming the lives they might have lived had they not left India. They seek to understand who they might have been had they stayed, or who their children would be if they could commit to return. There was a great deal about India that was worth learning, Shantarama Rao wrote in 1945, recalling her 1939 return to her grandmother's home in Bombay after years in London. But somehow, she says, I didn't have the equipment to begin. I wasn't a real Indian. The truth faced me at every turn. For Rao, the challenge was how to contribute to the negotiation of the terms of India's independence when she herself had been brought up in Europe and educated in England. She sought to establish herself as worthy of participation in an independent Indian public sphere. She writes, brought up in Europe and educated in preparatory and public schools in England, we felt that Indian conventions were not only retrogressive and socially crippling to the country, but also a little ridiculous. We thought at the time that one needed the perspective of travel to see these things, but we were only flattering ourselves. For later we found many young Indians who had lived at home all their lives and had a far clearer picture of India's social problems, and moreover were doing a great deal more towards solving them than we ever thought of doing, right? Now these kinds of memoirs are narratives of going home that strive above all to be worthy of home. 
There's a kind of tacit self-critique of having left India in the first place, as well as a humbling awareness that the nation is capable of functioning, thriving, and arriving into the future without the presence of someone like Rao. So home to narratives like Rao's, as well as Dan Gopal Mukherjee's Disillusioned India, or Ved Mehta's Walking the Indian Streets, are explorations of diasporic expendability. They're vulnerable texts in pursuit of responsibility. They express a desire for authenticity that is also a desire for a position of legitimacy from which to speak and act. As Rao realized in the same text, it's not that India has to prove itself to the returnee so much as the returnee has to have something to contribute to Indian life. And over half a century later, emergence writers are similarly struggling to square the idea that, in so many Sengupta's words, India has done just fine without the NRIs. <laughs> Briefly, another antecedent. Now, emergence nonfictionists generally don't uh, avow debts to Nehru or to Shantarama Rao, but many of them credit V.S. Naipaul's India trilogy as inspiration, right, for some obvious reasons. Amitabha Kumar attributes to Naipaul his desire to take up the writer's vocation. Amit Chowdhury says discovering Naipaul was the discovery of himself as a writer. Sukhadu Mehta reportedly read the India trilogy like a textbook. Now, given these striking professions of affiliation, we might ask how it is that narratives of India's rise came to be modeled on Naipaul's critiques of India's fall. Now, Naipaul was hard on India. You know this, to put it mildly. And the trilogy was marked by his indictment of India's mimicry of the West, the Indian preference for symbolism over action, the failures of Gandhian social reform, and so on. And Naipaul himself was generally notorious for what Edward Said described as his tendency to indict guerrillas for their pretensions rather than indict the imperialism and social injustice that drove them to insurrection, and so forth. But the scholarly tides are now turning towards a reconsideration of the origins and effects of Naipaul's critical impetus. So following someone like Sanjay Krishnan's assessment of Naipaul's anguished attempt by Naipaul to account for India's pull on far-flung, doubly diasporic subjects like himself, India is for me a difficult country, he wrote. It isn't my home and cannot be my home, and yet I cannot reject it or be indifferent to it. I cannot travel only for the sights. I'm too close and too far. Naipaul feels contempt for many of the Indians he meets, but also straining love. He deplores what he calls India's creative incapacity and intellectual depletion, and what he describes as the inadequacy of every Indian's idea of India. At the same time, he says, I did not want India to sink. The mere thought was painful, and so on. Now, at the heart of this tension is the fact that the Indian with the inadequate idea of India is Naipaul himself, and he knows it. In the prelude to an area of darkness, Naipaul describes the bureaucratic nightmare of trying to secure permits to reclaim two liquor bottles seized from him at customs in Bombay. You might remember this scene. It's hot. Nobody knows how to get the permit. Everyone's giving him half information. And when the aggrieved Naipaul shares this misadventure with a businessman friend, he finds that he himself is berated. Always the heat or the water with you people from outside, the businessman said. You make up your minds about India before coming to the country. You've been reading the wrong books. And this accusation then follows Naipaul and the rest of the book. And the first chapter actually begins with Naipaul's indignant response to the businessman. He writes, I have read any number of the right books. Of course, the trouble is that books do not give Naipaul adequate purchase on the India that he grew up with in Trinidad, an India that lay about us in things and yet was featureless. For Naipaul, returning to India is an attempt to make up for the inadequacy of textual representation and the vexed pull of a place that exists for him only in phantasmal memories. Return fulfills a lifelong desire to recover, revisit, and re-inhabit the past, and yet it's a moving horizon an impossible aspiration which, when attempted, doesn't ever live up to its promise. Now, for these emergence nonfictionists, as for Naipaul, the rise of India is also an epistemological break. It's an occasion to learn about India, to reclaim the knowledge that wasn't there. <coughs> like Naipaul, emergence writers seek, quote, to activate feelings of unease, to move out of their darkness, of their ignorance about history, home, and heritage into the light of self-knowledge. This rediscovery first takes autodidactic form. 
So Giridhar Das fills his shelves with books about India, quote, as though their presence alone would teach him about caste, Indian democracy, Kashmir, the leading industrialists, end quote. Mehta takes commissions from the West to write articles about India. Eventually, though, he realizes he has to live there again. Amit Chowdhury occasionally interrupts the primary narrative in Calcutta to offer teacherly passages. He writes, let's take a brief look at the word Bengali, the decline and marginalization of the Bengali language through the disappearance of the Badrulo class, through the processes of globalization, and on he goes. And such passages, I think, like the genre to which they belong, are both species of self-address and urgent pedagogy. They're the literary sign of an attempt to see and the artifactual evidence of seeing's fundamental provisionality. Okay, so thus far, my account of the emergence genre has tried to pay attention to its antecedents, its narrative form, and the diasporic and anthropological imaginaries that undergird its depiction of the new India. So in the final section of my presentation, I want to return to some of the questions with which I began about emergence nonfiction's relationship to the post-colonial and purchase on the neoliberal contemporary. Now in recent years, many literary scholars have begun to question whether what we call neoliberalism is actually neoliberal. The popular understanding of neoliberalism as what Wendy Brown calls an order of normative reason has taken hold as a universal mode of discourse because secondary sources on neoliberalism, like Brown, but also David Harvey, Bourdieu, and others, have actually been more widely read than the economic and social philosophy of the neoliberals themselves. So as a result, we equate neoliberalism with free market fundamentalism. We forget sometimes that neoliberalism posits a strong state, not an absent one. We use ahistorical phrases like Thatcherism and the Reagan era to signify the age of neoliberalism. And we read the neoliberal subject as an entrepreneur of the self who must self-brand and maximize and absorb risk in a world-made market in the absence of social provision. If we read the actual neoliberals like Milton Friedman and Friedrich, Friedrich, Hayes, the la Friedrich Hayek, the latter who preferred to think in terms of webs, networks, and ecosystems as opposed to entrepreneurs, maybe we would not make such errors or so this line of argument goes. Now what might the call to return to primary neoliberalism imply for the study of new Indian literature? In what ways is the neoliberalism constructed by intellectuals in a Swiss chalet in 1947, and here I'm referring to the inaugural meeting of the Mont Pelerin Society, how is that relevant to the neoliberalism of young Indians Snigdapuna meets in Indoor, whose life philosophies are mediated by Donald Trump the TV series Breaking Bad, and a decontextualized passage from Rudyard Kipling's If, and who tell Poonam that each and every one of them is an entrepreneur because, quote, everyone wants to be something. <laughs> if the emergence genre offers a textual engagement with Indian enterprise culture and what Lily Irani has recently theorized as entrepreneurial citizenship, then what do we make of the fact that it traffics primarily in secondary neoliberal tropes? If the neoliberal genre of emergence does not register the neoliberalism of actual neoliberals, does it follow that new Indian subjectivities are not neoliberal either? Now on the one hand, this line of questioning can take us only so far, demanding as it does strict continuity between neoliberalism as originally theorized and neoliberalism as lived, a standard that I think is inconsistent with the way we now understand actually existing forms of alternate vernacular and indigenized anglophonisms, modernities, and other dubious gifts of the West. On the other hand, the identification of the predominance of secondary neoliberalism in cultural studies broadly defined gets, I think, in one of the challenges of studying the literature of New India as well. Namely, it highlights the profoundly mediated nature of our apprehension of the contemporary, problematizes the idea that any one genre or discipline has access to the real or the truth, privileged access, and illuminates the ways in which popular writing, literary criticism, philosophical treatises, and social scientific studies all participate in the dissemination of public discourses that then come untethered from their origins, since they have both many and none. In a recent essay in this vein, Annie McClanahan argues that the reliance on secondary neoliberalism has led many critics to miss the structuring contradiction in conceptions of neoliberal subjecthood. This subject is given to us as one who is, quote, robbed of her non-instrumentalized humanity on the one hand, but, quote, imaginatively rich in human capital on the other, 
This contradiction, she argues, underlies the dominant elaboration of the neoliberal subject as one whose life could have been otherwise, whose humanity was in fact once non-instrumentalized, when in fact what neoliberalism actually points to is what she calls the introduction of economic exigencies into the lives of people once shielded from them. To summarize crudely, the neoliberal subject is not one. And this too may be what emergence nonfictions can show us. Not that call center agents and community activists and middle class housewives have all become entrepreneurs in a neoliberal new India, but rather that each of them is being called to reimagine their particular class and social positions in light of the global discourse of secondary neoliberalism, just as emergence writers have been called to document them and critics are called to read them. In Capital, to give just one example, Rana Daskupta writes about rich Indian women who devote their spare time to caring for stray dogs as well as surplus populations of Balswa colony, a place of what he describes as unwanted lives in which people can find almost no connection to the economic boom that surrounds them. And also young Indian men who want to get rich in all one go by hustling for a share of political money. These are subjects whose lives have always been characterized by economic exigency and those whose lives are still relatively free from it. Subjects who respond to ex economic exigency through the language and technologies of enterprise as well as those who reject that language. These are all subjects living under the conditions of contemporary global capitalism, all subjects of New India. But not one is neoliberal in a strict sense because human subjectivities are neither reducible to ideology nor to their interpolation as human capital by an aspirational state. The emergence genre is a key archive of the Indian contemporary. I hope at least maybe to have made you more interested in some of these texts. It's a genre that participates in the critical attenuation of post-colonialism, perpetuates the dominance of secondary neoliberalism, and realizes the fiction of New India, even as, as I have tried to show today, it also returns us to an overlooked archive of Indian Anglophone post-colonial nonfiction, problematizes the universality of largely American understandings of the neoliberal, and lays bare the constitutive contradictions of the New India discourse. So over and above representing New India then, emergence nonfictions are about the problem of producing that representation. The problem of apprehending a world so discursively overdetermined that you almost can't see it for what it is. As Amit Chowdhury writes in Calcutta, being physically in the New India to which he has returned doesn't finally bring him any closer to comprehending it. Not any closer than when he studied it from the airplane window. Thank you. Thank you so much for